ko horono tumo ana tapu ko sabo te awa ke fai moroa a ho e no hona ko kawe o te mona ko fai moroa te moa ko wai kato te awa e mi hiana ke akoto te na akoto te na akoto te na akoto kato yep i'm paul murray <laughs> although hardly ever <laughs> in fact never during my day job but i am known as mr x and most of the time as x man <laughs> at least according to the 6400 kids in the waikato and it's something to do with the first letter of the name of the place i stand here and represent extreme zero waste and the name pretty much sums up what we're all about extreme zero waste and we are a more than profit community enterprise we are a business created by a community for a community employing the community and in this case cleaning up the community and this is a story of how to create change one cardboard box at a time Now it's a stick in the sand uh, kind of story. It's um, one of those moments when you decide that enough is enough, and you draw a line in the sand, and you decide that that needs to change, and something else has to happen instead. <laughs> and the very next step that you take is the very first step into a new direction. Now this story takes place in Farangoroa, Raglan. And in my introduction just before, as I've learned from Tiao Māori, that to introduce yourself, you introduce your place, your land, your water. Uh, and, you, and I introduced my uh, mountain and my river and my harbour and my lake. Now that's interesting because I've also found out that up to 50 to 65% of the average adult human body is made up of water. So the very water that we drink becomes our body. And in my case, I live on a patch of land where I drink from a spring. So that water is me. And I am that water. Ko au te awa. Ko te awa. Ko au. And healthy water is healthy me. And the same can be said for land. The more soil, the more nutrients in the soil, the more nutrient dense the plants that grow in it. And the more nutrients in my body when I eat them. So I am the land. The land is me. And healthy land is helping me. So in looking after our place, in looking after our land and our water, we are looking after us. And this is very much the story of Extreme Zero Waste, where a community took action to care for its land and to care for its people, and in so doing, cared for its community. Now, in our case, the story was the decision we needed to change was that our harbour was sick. In fact, it was one of the sickest harbours in the country. It was one of the worst harbour fisheries. And one of the contributing factors to this was the dump. As in, dirt hole in the ground, unlined, built over a stream, and dump. <laughs> And if you can imagine the most toxic, poisonous, leachate, leaking, rubbish juice oozing its way down the harbour, into the stream, into the harbour, over the shellfish beds, and right into the most popular swimming spots of town. That needed to change. But the second part of this problem was that the dump was going to close, and residents were facing hefty charges to transfer their waste the stuff that they no longer wanted from their place to someone else's place. Now, it was the late Eva Rickard, who was known for her leadership in the Māori land struggles of Raglan, who was the first to lay down the challenge and say, clean up the water, fix that leachate leak, and recycle as much as possible. So the Raglan community did exactly that. And they did something kind of radical, like clean up their own mess and establish their own waste management system for their own community. 
And instead, they based it on principles of zero waste. Now, zero waste is an interesting concept because it challenges the whole story. It's not looking at just the final chapter where you're thinking of how you get rid of stuff. It goes right back to the very beginning of what you're even using to make your stuff and how you're making it and how you're using it and then how you're getting rid of it. And it challenges that one-way dead-end system of take, make, dump. And keep in mind that the stuff that we're taking most of the time, we only have once to use non-renewable resources. And we're designing stuff that we only use once. And then we're dumping it in a way that kind of lasts forever and can't be used again. Whereas zero waste seeks to reconnect us back to the patterns of our finite world, where everything gets recycled back into itself, and everything gets reused and put back into another function, or another purpose, or another nutrient, or something, but everything in nature is used again. There is no such thing as waste in nature. Humankind is the only species that has this one-way, dead-end, linear system. Dump. So zero waste seeks to close the loop to keep our stuff going again and again. Now keep in mind, this story was happening way back in the olden days of 1998, when recycling was a fairly new concept, and few councils, if any, were yet to support and fund such a scheme. So the Raglan community knew that this was a, mo a matter of creating a new picture that didn't yet exist. They were creating a future that they wanted to see. They were being the change that they wanted to see happen in their community. And so they began by doing, literally, in their own cars and in their own time and with their own petrol and with their own money and even with their own families, they started by picking up and collecting the paper and cardboard waste of their community. And they continued doing so for as long as it would take for council to catch up with the idea and to realize that this community meant business, that they really did want to see a recycling program set up in their community. And that took two years. Imagine that. Imagine voluntarily picking up your town's waste in your own car for two years because you thought it was a good idea, because you thought it was important. Now that is extreme. <laughs> now let's jump ahead. Oh, so in 2000, then, in the year 2000, the Incorporated Society of Extreme Waste later to become Extreme Zero Waste began. Let's jump ahead to the future then, 15 years later, and see what's happened since. Well, the leak shape leak has stopped, and the harbour has been cleaned up. In fact, it's gone from being one of the worst harbour fisheries in the country to one of the best. Worst? Best. 15 years, just like that. And in their journey towards zero waste, Raglan has shot to the top of being one of the best in waste management practice in New Zealand. In fact, for the last 10 years, the Raglan community has been diverting 75% of its waste from landfill. That means of all the stuff in the community that people no longer want, 75% does not end up in the ground. But instead, we are finding ways of reusing and recycling and rebuilding and repairing and refurbishing and reselling and repurposing and everything we can think of to keep those things going around and around again rather than ending up in the hole. And what was once the one-man job, the lonely post of overseeing that dirt hole that was slowly poisoning town, has become 26 jobs for our local community to look after our place. 26 jobs in a small town, west coast, population 2,700. That's a big deal. And this not-for-profit company that where no single person or no single business, or sorry, group owns the business, where all money made goes back into the community, now has a turnover of $1.2 million. And in last year, 651,000 of that went straight back into the community in the form of wages. Because it's no longer a volunteer gig, 
Everybody gets paid for their part in this story now. And a further 242,000 last year was spent locally in our own economy. So we are busy creating long-term employment solutions by converting our waste stream into resources that we can keep and use for us. Here's a great example. So you can come along to Extreme Zero Waste and drop off your green waste for free, right there. And we have people whose job it is is to turn it into this. Ta-da! Compost. <laughs> Look at that. It was waste from our community. And it was created into something else within our community. And then it was sold back to our community. And it made money for our community. How clever is that? <laughs> and we've got many other such stories going on like that. But furthermore, we're keeping and holding on to our human resources, the people and the skills and the talents and abilities in our community to do these jobs so that we can get council contracts to look after our own affairs and to manage our own business. So, and we've done all this uh, using what we call a socially responsible business model. We have what we call a quadruple bottom line. So our decisions are based on social, cultural, environmental, and economic reasoning. It's not just the bottom line. It's not just what's cheapest, and it's not just what makes the most money. It has to be good for our land, and it has to be good for our people, and good for our place. So we make the business work for us, and we do this by designing out waste pollution and resource depletion, and by designing in job creation, local economic resilience, and resource abundance. So Extreme Zero Waste has cleaned up, uh, created jobs, boosted the local economy, empowered their community, built resilience, and reduced waste. That's a pretty good track record, but that's not the end of the story. Because empowerment like this is infectious, and it spreads, and it creates other opportunities for other things to happen. And from the onset, Extreme Zero Waste has engaged in delivering education programs to households, businesses, councils, schools, community groups. We like to share our story and some of our good ideas. And so what were once known as the Bangalore hippies, <laughs> who weren't taken too seriously, who didn't even have the right equipment, or the money, or the expertise to do this stuff. Some of these guys are now paid consultants to councils all over the country, from our biggest city right down to other community groups just like us. Because they can see that the community model works, that there is pride, ownership, and a sense of and invest, vested interest. And of course we're going to make this work because this is our land and our people and our place. So they want to do the same thing in their place and we're very happy to help. Here's another outcome of Extreme Zero Waste, Pilot Koro, which you can guess in Pira Maori means zero waste. And look at this. Here's all the marae now working across the country, all over the place, working on closing their loop and looking after their land and their people. Here's where I come into the story. Through council, we also get funding to deliver zero waste education programs into schools. And I'm a teacher, so I'm spending my days having conversations with the future. I'm talking to the next generation about how to get off this one-way, dead-end system and how to keep our stuff going. Not just for us, but for our kids, and for our kids' kids, and even for their kids. There's an African proverb I really like, which was famously painted on the last remaining 100-metre section of the Berlin Wall. And it was painted in 1990 at a time of great social change. And it says, Many small people who in many small places do many small things can alter the face of the world. Now, that's empowering for kids because they can see that there are many small actions, there are many little everyday actions, and all their little places all add up 
to big outcomes. Lots of little local action equals big global impact. But that goes both ways. And many small people doing many non-sensible things, like staying on the one-way dead-in system, for example, single-use plastic bags to the tune of three million every single day in New Zealand, can also alter the face of the world, not in the way that we are hoping for. But zero waste is a brilliant medium for affecting social change because every single person is connected to the story of waste. Every single person here is connected to the story of waste. All of us, every single day, face multiple opportunities for us to decide what do we want to choose. Is it going to be the one-way dead-end system, or are we going to choose something that will keep things going and put it back into the system? We all have that choice, many small actions, every single day. But it starts with the decision. Simple actions, yes, putting it in the right place, but it starts with that stick in the sand moment. It starts with choosing. It starts with having enough and deciding that that has to change and something else has to happen instead. But many of us making that choice together can affect great change, just like those brave raglan pioneers 17 years ago who were stomping on cardboard voluntarily in their own time in the rain I wonder if they ever imagined that that choice they made back then to clean up their place and to do the simple action that was in front of them, if they ever thought that years later, councils, schools, marae, communities, and cities all over the country would be inspired by and learning from and changing from their example. Zero Waste has changed our community. It's changing other communities. It can certainly change your community. So, how bad does your water have to get before you make that choice, like our story? What will you decide when you leave this place today with the thing you're holding in your hand or the thing you're going to buy on the way home or how you're going to carry it back to your place? Will you make a choice that is adding to the one-way dead-end system? Or will you make a choice that puts it back into the loop and keeps it connected to a finite planet to keep it going for our future? What will your stick-in-the-sand moment be? And are you ready for the change that could unleash in your community? Ko taku to te manuka ake. Now I lay the challenge down at your feet. And it's for you to decide. And may your next step that you take be the very first step into a new future of change, hopefully towards zero waste. Kia ora. <laughs>